Praise the Lord and good morning. This is New Life Experience located at 5708 Howard Falls Drive in the beautiful city of Savannah, Georgia. We would like to take this time to welcome you on behalf of our pastor, District Elder John Philip Anderson and his lovely wife, Sister Sally Anderson, and the New Life family. We would also like to invite you out to our weekly services, which begin on Sunday mornings at 11.30 a.m. Sunday School, 12.30 p.m. is morning worship. On Wednesday nights, I'm sorry, Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. is Bible class. And on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. is prayer. Once again, we would like to invite you out to our services. And we thank God for you joining in with us today. Today at 12.30 p.m. will be our morning service. Please tune in to the morning service. And there you can receive the number to the prayer line, which will be in operation on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. With that being said, we thank you for tuning in with us, and we honor God, our Father, and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has given us strength and the ability to come before you with a fresh word from God. So in Jesus' name, we thank you, we honor you, and we invite you to come on out to be in the house with us on today at 12.30 p.m. And with this, let us go into our Sunday school lesson. However, before we go into our Sunday school lesson, we want to take just a few minutes to talk about the day of Pentecost. Because as you know, today is actually the day of Pentecost for 2023. Pentecost was called Shavuot in the Old Testament, and it was actually the day when God descended on Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel. So on Shavuot was the birth of the nation of Israel, and on Pentecost, which is Shavuot, was also the birth of the New Testament church. And for that, we give God glory. And we give him honor. So there's a few things I found out about Pentecost just this morning that I would like to share with you. And this is from the Jewish aspect. It says, for the Jewish people, Shavuot, which means weeks, marks the event, describes in Exodus chapter 19, when God came down in flames of fire on Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites, seven weeks after the Exodus from Egypt. This is considered the moment Israel was born as a nation and called to be the light of nations. For Christians, the same festival is known as Pentecost and also recalls the events of Acts chapter 2 when tongues of fire descended upon 120 followers of Jesus gathered in the upper room, fulfilling the promise that the Comforter would soon come to them. The church was born on that day and endured with power to fulfill its great commission. Now we want to talk briefly about tongues. Rabbinical tradition holds that everywhere God spoke that day was like a stroke of a hammer on an Advil. With each stroke of the Advil, which was at Mount Sinai, sparks or tongues of fire flew upward. First century sage Rabbi Jonathan uh, maintained that it split up into 70 languages matching the languages spoken among the 70 early nations. In other words, Israel realized from the beginning that the Torah would be significant not only to Jews but to mankind also. It is therefore no coincidence that tongues of fire would later descend on human flesh on the day of Pentecost when praises to God were heard by devout men out of every nation under heaven and that every man heard them speak in his own language. Like Israel at Sinai, the church received a universal commission to go forth from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth with a message of hope, salvation, and love based on God's very character. It reached to the entire known world at that time, and today people from literally every nation, tribe, and tongue have been added to the divine movement that sparked on the day of Pentecost. I think this is very telling. And what it tells us is that even... Pentecost itself is not a New Testament phenomenon. Tongues itself is not a New Testament phenomenon. But it was rooted all the way back on Shavuot, the day that the children of Israel gathered around Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, and this article, it goes even more into um, the significance of the tongues of fire that sat upon each of them in the upper room and the tongues of fire that were seen on Mount Sinai back in the book of Exodus. And I thought that was really amazing to, to learn that. So from there, we're going to move on into our lesson for today. And our lesson for today, it's going to dovetail a little bit on this, but it's going to come from St. John chapter 17. And we're going to begin reading at, I'm going to begin reading at verse number one, but our lesson begins reading at verse number six. 
So St. John 17, verse number 6. And what these two are going to have in common is the significance of glorifying God. And what actually is it, does it mean to literally glorify God? I'm going to be uh, reading from the Complete Jewish Study Bible. The words you're going to see is from the King James Version. Now probably go back and forth. But from King James, it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Verse number two. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Three. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thy me with thine own self with the glory which thou had, which I had with thee before the world was. And verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now I'm going to park right there, because from there we're going to get ready to go into our lesson, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some background. So, as I read this lesson this morning, uh, two things that, words that were very interesting to me really popped out. And one of the words was glorify, and the other word is name. Glorify and name. And we're going to concentrate on those two words for a minute. Now, the first question that came to my mind was, what does it really mean to glorify God? Because when Jesus was speaking in the 17th chapter of the book of St. John, this was his great intercessory prayer. It was, this was actually the Lord's prayer. Now, what we see in Matthew chapter 6, where the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples how to pray. And then Jesus said, in this manner pray ye, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, etc. This was not a particular, this was not a prayer that we are supposed to just say over and over and over again. What Jesus actually gave them was an outline on how to pray. That was what the disciples asked him. Master, teach us how to pray. And Jesus was teaching them how to pray. Now, if we take St. John chapter 17, and use Matthew chapter 6 as the uh, template, we will see the prayer Jesus prayed goes right into that particular template of what Jesus laid out in Matthew chapter 6. But anyway, as I stated, my main question was, that came to my mind, what does it mean to glorify God? And Jesus said, glorify your son as your son so that your son may glorify you. What? does it mean to glorify? Sometimes when we think about the word glorify, we think about the word praise or we think about the word worship. And in a way, that's true. But to glorify would be the ultimate praise or the ultimate worship. And what is the ultimate praise or the ultimate worship that God is looking for? Let's look at the example of Jesus. Well, the book of Colossians tells us that he was the express image of the Godhead bodily. Okay? And uh, John chapter 14, Jesus told Philip, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And now in John chapter 17, Jesus said, ask the Father that to, uh, the time has come for you to glorify your son. In other words, glorify me so that I may glorify you. St. John chapter 11, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, we find out before Jesus came, Jesus told his disciples that the death of Lazarus was not unto death, but it was so that God's glory could be manifested. So when we look at the words glory in all of these particular instances, the word glory or the word glorify does not, the, what we call sometimes praise, the lifting up the hands, the clapping of the hands, the stumping of the feet or whatever, doesn't fit in this particular mode. But we're still talking about glorifying the Father. So what I did was I began to look up the word glorify, and sometimes when we look up things in a dictionary, what we need to do is go a little bit deeper than just looking up the word 
but look up the etymology of the word or the history of the word or the origin of the word. And that gives us a better understanding of what it means. And so when I did that, I found out that the word to glorify means to be a mirror image of. To glorify is to be a mirror image of. What greater compliment what greater uh, appreciation can be shown? What greater homage could be paid to someone than to, for that person to be glorified or for someone to become a mirror image of that person? When we look into a mirror, we see an image of ourselves, and sometimes we like what we see, and sometimes we don't like what we see. And when we talk about glorifying God, <clears throat> we are supposed to become a mirror image of him so that when he looks at us, hopefully he will like what he sees. Now, Jesus said, Father, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. So in other words, Father, let us become one so that people can see you in me and me in you. That's what he's saying. When we, glor when we glorify God, we are supposed to be an express image of him so people will see him in us. In other words, they will see the image of God in us. When God created Adam, God created Adam in his what? In his image. And the Bible tells us, I believe it's in the book of Corinthians, that the glory of God is man. God wants to see his image in man. Now, Jesus Christ, as Colossians says, was the express image of the Godhead bodily. Jesus told Philip, when you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Because everything that the Father is, is in me. Everything that the Father is, I've, you have seen it because you've seen me express it to you. So this is what the word is saying when it says that we that he wants to glorify the Father. And if we go down a little bit further, we are, the, it, I'm sorry, when we go down a little bit further, we understand that it is our job to bring glory to the Father. That is what Jesus did. He brought glory to the Father. He introduced the Father to the world. Let's keep it going. Jesus said this in verse number three. And this is eternal life, to know you, the one true God. I'm reading from Complete Jewish Study Bible. You have King James. Uh, eternal life is this, to know you, the one true God, and him you, who you have sent, Jesus the Messiah. So when we talk about having eternal life, and I want you to think about this. What is eternal life? What makes life eternal? And I'll, I'll phrase it that way. What makes life eternal? Is eternal life living on planet earth forever and ever and ever and just never dying, never being buried? Is that eternal life? I don't think so. Eternal life, Jesus said this, is to know the one true God. How is that eternal life? Well, first of all, we have to look at that word no. The word no doesn't mean I heard about you so I have everlasting life. Or I heard about you, I heard the name Jesus. So I know him, so I have eternal life. No, that's not what it means. To know the one true God is to have intimacy with the one true God. To know is to be intimate with. You can know of people and not know the person. You know of President Biden, but I'm pretty sure you don't know him. You know of Barack Obama, but I'm pretty sure you don't know him. Michelle knows him. We don't know him. Okay, so to know the one true God is eternal life. There is that intimate relationship wherein he, you are in him, and he is in you, and God is eternal, and the life that flows from him flows unto you. Remember last week's lesson. I am the true vine, and you are the branches Every branch in me that bringeth forth not fruit is he taketh away, 
But if you are branching me and you bring forth fruit, he prunes it. How can a branch bring forth fruit because it's in the vine? Because the life of the vine flows into the branches. And it's the same. So let's put it this way. When the branches are intimate with the vine, the branches can live. Because life from the vine flows into the branches. When we are intimate, meaning know Christ Jesus or know the one true God, the life of God flows from him into us, thus giving us eternal life. Why is it? Because God is eternal. So whether in the flesh or out of the flesh, if you're in the Father, you have life. Mm, interesting. So he says this in verse number four. He says, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Jesus said, I do the things that please the Father. Whatsoever I've seen the Father do, that's what I do. He was a mirror image of the Father. That was how he glorified the Father. By being the image of the Father. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. What work did he give him to do? Jesus said, the works I do, I do not of my own accord, but it's the Father that works through me. Could that be a lot of what we miss today? God working through us? I think, it, I think we do miss it a lot. Because one reason I think that, I, that we miss it a lot is because in our fleshly way of thinking, we assume accolades for men mean you're doing a good job. Or we may assume that a pat on the back from someone we admire mean we're on the right track. And that's not necessarily true. Ooh, it's really not true. Because if I'm wrong and you're wrong and both of us wrong, you can validate my wrong. And that doesn't make me right. If I'm teaching or preaching something that in, that's an error, just because you agree with it doesn't make me right. What the deal is, is both of us messed up. Hello. So, Jesus said, I glorified you on earth because I finished the work you gave me to do. Hmm. I finished. So, Father, glorify me alongside yourself. So because I've done what you told me to do, Father, I'm asking you to glorify me with thine own self, with the glory I had before the world was. Now what does this mean? Glorify me with thine own self, with the glory I had before the world was. So let's find out where was Jesus before the world was. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him not anything was made that was made. So where was he before the world was? He was in the beginning in God with God. He said, glorify me with the glory I had before the world was. So, by the mouth of two or three, every word, let every word be established. So, we got St. John 1 and 1, but now we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, we know that the worlds were framed by what? The word of God. Therefore, things which appear were not made by things which do appear. In other words, things which we see wasn't necessarily formed by, the, by other things that we see. Because by faith we know that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And St. John 1 and 1 tells us the word was God. Hello. So Jesus said, Father, glorify me with the glory I had before the world was. So glorify me with yourself. Because I was in you from the beginning. And God, glorify me with yourself as I was in the beginning. Let's keep it moving. A complete Jewish study Bible say, give me the same glory I had with you before the world existed. Now, this is the other part I want to get to, verse number six. We know about glory. Glory is to mirror, to mirror his image, to mirror the image of God, okay? His glory, glorifying God would be when people look at us, they see Christ in us. You know, there was a time a while back where people, they could, they could look at you and tell you were saved. Now it ain't too much like that. But it was like that by th back then. 
a person could look at you and they could sense it. I mean, they could see you coming and they knew that, you know, this, yeah, this, this, this person saved. Now, some people can still discern that. Some people can still discern that. Okay, I'll leave that alone. So, anyway, glorifying God is expre being uh, Im the express image of him. Jesus Christ was the express image of the Godhead bodily. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay? And we're going to tie this with some other scriptures coming up. Now, here we go. We're going to talk, we talked about what it means to glorify God. Now we're going to talk about how to glorify God. What it means to glorify God is you become the express, express image of him, that you mirror his likeness, that you do what he did, that you say what he says, okay, that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Now, verse number six, he said, I have made known your name. Well, I have made your name known to the people you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. King James, I have manifest thy name unto the men which you gave me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now, let's dig into this one. As I said it earlier, I, I asked myself this morning, what does it mean? name okay because although we would like we would like to say that when Jesus said that I made thy name known unto the men that gave it to me that that some kind of way means that God's name is Jesus and because the disciples knew that Jesus' name was Jesus that God's name must have been Jesus that's not what that's saying now how do I know that's what they're saying? Because you got to dig a little bit. Do a deep dive, as they say. What is a name? That's the first question. What is a name? And that's what, something that we really lost in the Western world because we, when we issue names, we issue names based on feelings. We issue names maybe based on an experience. We issue names based on, well, that just sounds cute to me. Um... But names goes a lot deeper than that. A name is actually what's called your appellation. And your appellation is, it's a word that's spoken over you that should reveal who you really are. Think about it. A name, that's, a name is a word spoken over you that reveals who you are. So, when Jesus was named, Okay? Oh, no, let's go back. Moses changed Joshua's name to Joshua. Now, Joshua had another name. Moses was the one that gave him Joshua. And I have to go back and find that scripture. I should have found it before I came in, but I didn't know I was going this way. But um, Joshua had another name. And Moses changed Joshua's name to Joshua. Now, why would Moses do something like that? Joshua means deliverer. Who would have known or did Moses know at that time that Joshua would be the one to carry the children of Israel into the promised land? Because it means deliverer. Now, let's go up a couple hundred years. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Did you know that the, believe us, the Hebrew name for G, no, Yeshua is the Jewish, is the Jewish name. Jesus, Yeshua is the same. Okay? But the word Joshua also is translated Yeshua, which is translated Jesus. Why is that important? What does the name mean? If Joshua meant deliverer, Yeshua means deliverer, Jesus means deliverer. What is another word for deliver? Salvation. The word Jesus, he, she should call his name Jesus, for he should what? Save his people from their sins. Moses changed, jo changed Joshua's name, I forgot what his name was before, his name to Joshua because he was going to what? 
be the one to bring Israel into the promised land, thus wrought a salvation for Israel. Now, Jesus said, I have manifest thy name, and we say your name is, the, is your appellation. Your name is what is the word spoken over your life to tell who you are. Jesus said, I have manifested your name to those that you have given me out of the world. What was he saying here? Jesus manifested God's salvation. Jesus was a manifestation of God's deliverance. Once again, Jesus was the express image of the Godhead bodily. Everything that the Father was or is was made manifest in Jesus Christ. He manifested everything the Father was. So if he manifested all that the Father was, the name is the appellation. He manifested all that the Father was. What did he manifest in this earth? The what? The name, the authority. When you do something in the name of someone, you do it in their authority. He said, I have manifested your name. I have manifested your authority. I have manifested who you are to the men that you've given me. They were thine. And he said, check this out. They were thine. Before the foundation of the world, God knew who we were. God knows who we are. Before the foundation of the world, God told, I believe it was Jeremiah, before I created you in the womb, I knew you. So Jesus is saying, concerning these 12, not they are just thine, but they were thine. And thou gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. How did they keep their word when they messed up so much? Well, Sister Scott, how did they mess up? Well, one big mess up was when um, the Syrophoenician woman came and they said, Lord, the woman was in need, and they said, Lord, send her away. Another good mess up was when the children wanted to be blessed, and they said, Lord, send them away. And Jesus said, no, 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 uh -uh, no. Another, <laughs> there was a lot of little mess ups. There was times when Jesus asked the disciples, he's like, don't, don't, don't you even get it? I mean, there was one part where Jesus said, have you no understanding that I'm not talking about the fish and the loaves, I'm talking about the leaven of the Pharisees? And he had to correct them many times. And a big blunder was Jesus telling him, I'm about to be crucified. And then they come to him and like, uh, can my son sit on your left hand and on your right hand? I just told you I'm about to die. And you asked me something like that? That would be my reaction. I just told you I'm about to die. And you asking me, because somebody sit on my right hand and my left hand. Don't he? Makes you wonder about folks. I mean, really makes you wonder about folks. So, although they had these mess ups, Jesus said, they have kept thy word. So how did they keep his word even with the mess ups? How can you keep God's word even with the mess ups? By holding on to him and not letting go. By holding on to him. Because when you hold on to him, you hold on to his word. Why? Because he is the word. They did not let him go. That was how they kept his word. So, Sister Scott, can I, um, could I still be just as keeping God's word if I mess up? Yeah, as long as you don't let him go. Thy word has I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, but I messed up. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, but I messed up bad. Still, thy word have I hid in my heart, Lord. God connects to his word. You keep that word in your heart, God will connect to you. So, he says, um, where am I? Okay, that was verse number six. I made known your name. That's your authority. That's your power. That's who you are. To the people you gave me out of the world, they were yours, you gave them in, they have kept your word. Now, they know that everything you have given me is from you. Because they continued, they continued in me because they kept your word, now they know that everything that I have came from you. Everything. Because guess what? Jesus told them that the miracle just, it's not me, but it's the Father that works through me. And they stuck with him. They stayed. So now they know that all that you have given me are of 
are of you. Because the word you gave me, I have given them. And they have received them. So I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou, thou didst send me. And this is what it says in the complete Jewish study Bible. Because the word you gave me, I have given to them. And they have received them. They have really come to know that I came from you. And they have come to trust that you sent me. Powerful. Now, verse number nine, he says, I'm praying for them, okay? I pray not for the world, but for them that thou hast given me, for they are thine. So now Jesus is saying this, I'm praying for them, for who? The ones that you gave me. I'm not praying for the world, but for those who you have given me, because they are thine. Now, next. Indeed, all I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and in them I have been glorified. All that I have belongs to you, Father. All that you have belongs to me, and I am glorified in them. He goes on. Where am I? I am no longer in the world. They are in the world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, guard them by the power of your name, which you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. We're looking at a growing process. So Jesus is saying here, now I'm no longer in the world. And this was something that I said earlier that I, just, I, I couldn't understand this verse. But I was like, well, where was he? If right here he's saying I'm no longer in the world, is he talking to his disciples? Is he in heaven? Is he on earth? Where, where, where is he right now? But then a thought came to my mind. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, if we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, are you still on planet earth? Yeah, but I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How could that be? The difference between position and location. My position is I am seated in heavenly places. My location right now is planet earth. One day my position and location is going to be one and the same, but right now, my position is I'm seated in heavenly places. Jesus is, and I'm thinking this is his position he's talking about. No longer in the world, in other world, in other words, uh, the prince of this world cometh, he have nothing in me. Okay? I'm no longer, I'm not held in bondage to the rudiments of this world. I'm not held in bondage to uh, space and time. I'm no longer in this world. Okay? And he said, and I come to thee, Holy Father. He's praying for them to keep through thy name those who thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Now, one of the epistles of John, where John talks about Jesus Christ being the, our intercessor, and at this particular point, Jesus is in his office as intercessor. He is making intercession for his apostles. I'm no longer in the world. Why? I'm in the position of intercession. Intercession. Intercessor. Okay? So he prays for them and he said, keep them through thine own name. What name is that? What does it mean through that name? Through that authority. Keep them through your the authority of your name those who you have given me. His name, once again, means his authority. His name, once again, is who not just what he's called, but who he is. We look at a name as what a person's called. In Eastern cultures, they look at a name of, as what a person is. Once again, Joshua meant salvation, meant Deliverer, that's who he was. Moses, they named him Moses because I drew him from the water. That's who he was, the one who was drawn from the water. Okay? If we look at uh, the, the, the uh, meanings of different names of the different prophets, we will see how those names fit what they did, who they were. So even when we name our children, we need to be careful what we name them because it may come back to bite us. One of the things 
things that I notice, a lot of boys with a certain name usually you end up seeing on the news. And I wonder, what does that name mean? And I'm not going to say the name, but it's, it's odd. A lot of people with a certain name usually end up on the news. They all have the same first name. Be careful what we name our children, okay? Because your name depicts who you are. Now, he says here, I want you to keep them through your own name, those you've given me. Why? So that they can be one as we are one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. Many members, one body. He wants us to be one, just like he and the Father is one. How do we know he and the Father is one? St. John 1 and 1. Beginning was the word. Word was with God. Word was God. Oh, I was with God and I was God. Yes, they were one. He wants us to be one as they are one. But then he takes it a little bit further, a little bit further down. Not only does he want us to be one, but he wants us to be one with him. Here we go. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. So right now he's not praying for the world. He's just talking about here, those, but those who you have given me because they are yours. Indeed, all I have is yours. Talking to the father. All that I have is yours and all that you have is mine. And in them, I have been glorified. Ooh, there's that word glorified again. What does glorified mean? It means to mirror his image. So my image is being mirrored in them. I am the light of the world. Now you are the light of the world. As he was, so are we in this world. We are supposed to mirror his image. That brings glory to him. He don't care how much hand clapping and foot stomping you do. If you don't ma ma mirror his image, you ain't doing nothing. And then there are those who don't do the hand clapping and don't do the foot stomping, but they mirror his image. That brings glory to him. Here we go. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. And in them, I have been glorified. Now they are doing the works I sent them forth to do at this point. The apostles were going out. They were laying hands on the sick. They were casting out devils. They were raising the dead at this point. And he said, now I'm no longer in this world, but they are in the world. But I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Guard them by the power of your name, which you have given to me, so that they may be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I guarded them by the power of your name which you have given to me. Yes, I kept watch over them, and not one of them is destroyed except for the son of perdition. But now I am coming to you, and I say these things while I am still in the world. Remember I talked about the difference between position and location? When he said I'm not in the world, he was talking about position. Now he's saying that I'm in the world, he's talking about location. So he said, I say these things while I am still in the world. That's verse number 13 so that they may have joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I myself do not belong. That's how we're going to marry this image. The world is not going to accept you. The world is not going to want you around. Just as, as I uh, do not belong to the world. I don't ask, but check this out. I don't ask that you take them out of the world. This is the thing. Because if we mirror Christ's image and he take us out the world, who else can be saved if all of us just leave at one time? I mean, really think about it. We want a grand escape. We want to go where the wicked should cease from trouble and the weary should be at rest. Okay, I understand that. But that may not be his plan. He said, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil that's in the world and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Remember, this is the Matthew uh, 6 was the template for the prayer. This is the prayer. Don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil that's in the world. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then he goes on. Set them apart for holiness by means of your truth. In other words, you sanctify them. Keep them in the world, but separate them from the world. It's kind of like this. A fish should be in the ocean, but the whole ocean not in the fish. A fish can be underwater, but it ain't going to drown. You can be in the world, but you don't have to drown in the world. Keep 
them. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. So what is it that separates us from the world although we're in the world? You have the word of God in you. If you don't have the word of God in you, you don't have much to work with. That's why it's important to get the word of God in you because a little dab won't do you. You got to have the word in you. So sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, have I sent them into the world? On their behalf, I am setting myself apart for holiness. In other words, I am sanctifying myself. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they might also be sanctified. Ooh, this comes up in one of the epistles. He is the perpetuation for our sins, but he is also our intercessor. So Jesus is saying, I am sanctifying or separating myself through the truth so that he can do what? So that he can intercede on our behalf. You can't intercede for somebody if you're doing the same dumb things they're doing. You have to be above that. Don't pray for me. If I got a problem with... um. If I, got a, if I got a problem and you got the exact same problem, don't you lay no hands on me. Seriously. If I got a spirit of gossip on me and you a gossip too, don't lay hands on me. Because what, 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 what can you do for me when you a gossip too? What are we going to do? Just double up and make the spirit of gossip even worse? I need somebody that's delivered to pray for me. Jesus is delivered. <laughs> so when he prayed for us, woo, we can have what we ask for. When he praying for us, when the Holy Ghost is making intercession for us, hey, we got it. Anyway, I pray not for these. Okay, okay. verse number 20. I pray not for these only, but for those who will believe on me through their word. So Jesus is saying here, I'm not just praying for the apostles now, but for those who's going to believe on me through their word. Those are the ones that I'm praying for. So he prayed for us via praying for his apostles that we will believe the word of the apostles. But in order for us to believe the word of the apostles, we have to hear the word. Therefore, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We got to hear it before we believe it. Amen? Amen. And with this, I am out of time. God bless you. We will have uh, Sunday school again next Sunday at 1130 a.m., and um, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me, I'm going to tell you. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, the more I study, the more I learn, the more I look, the more I read, the more I learn, the more I research. And I realize we need to look up some of these words that we've been quoting for a whole long time. Because I just learned this morning what it means to glorify him. To really glorify him. And it wasn't what I thought it was. To be a mirror image of him is, his, is to show his glory. To mirror his image is to show his glory. And that's what he's looking for. Us to mirror his image. That is when the father is glorified. When we look like him, act like him, talk like him, walk like him. That's when he's glorified. Not when I shout. I also realize now what it means to be in the name. That's under his authority. And if I operate in his authority, then I can do the works that he do. But if I'm not operating in his authority, it don't matter how much I pray, it don't matter how much I fast. If I'm not operating under his authority, ain't nothing going to happen. His name is his authority. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We are out of time. And once again, if you are watching via Facebook or whatever, service begins at 1238. It's 12.30 p.m. If you come in today, you're just in time to be late, but it's okay with us. Just come on in. Amen? Amen. God bless you. You have a blessed week. Bye-bye. And it's
every day.